Welcome everyone to session 14. This is our fourth session on beams. In our last session, we discussed bending stresses and how to calculate them given a bending moment acting across a beam. In this session, we're going to focus on stresses within a beam, but these are going to be shear stresses. In the first part, <clears throat> we're going to discuss shear stress and what we might term very short beams. And these conditions are known as single shear and double shear. You may be a little bit familiar with the concept of having a pin going through a couple of plates or a bolt, or we'll show some other scenarios where you're essentially pulling apart or pushing two plates together and causing either some stress on the thing between them or actually trying to to shear, to break this object. And then double shear we'll also discuss in some scenarios where this uh, design really is useful for being able to manage or reduce the amount of shear stress that the material will have to see. After we discuss single shear and double shear, we'll get into how to relate the internal shear force to transverse shear stress along a beam. Now, what is transverse shear stress? Transverse shear stress is a shear stress, so a stress acting uh, along the, the face, a uh, tangent to a face, and in this case is acting on faces that are aligned with the longitudinal direction of a beam. So imagine that you have a beam with a bunch of different laminates. Uh, stacked on top of each other, a bunch of different pieces of wood stacked on the top, top of each other, which is what people will commonly refer to in, in mechanics and materials. Let's say that we have this force and we have these reaction forces. What are the transverse shear stresses going to look like in this object? Well, we haven't derived anything yet, and we will, but as a starter, what you would see is that there are these shear stresses acting along the longitudinal direction and they are maximum or at a maxima when they are close to the neutral axis. This is in contrast, of course, to what we saw with bending stresses, which were maxing out at the top or the bottom surfaces of beams. Now, We'll use equilibrium yet again to derive expressions or a big expression that goes between the shear stress and the shear force. So this equation is one that you'll we'll, we'll definitely come back to and, and derive and spend some time on. In part three, though, we're going to spend some time discussing this variable here, Q. So I, as we discussed in the last session, is the second moment of area. Q is what we call the first moment of area and is often associated with the calculation of centroids for a given geometry. So we'll be focusing in our third part quite a bit on the geometry and figuring out how to calculate Q. Well, let's go ahead and continue with part one that discusses or in which we will discuss single and double shear. So in single shear, we're looking at a scenario where maybe we have a pin or some type of material or object where there are sliding plates with equal and opposite forces. And within or between, vertically in this case, these two plates, there is what we'll call a narrow gap given by this kind of grayish area. And this narrow gap is the region that is experiencing high shear. So the highest shear forces and stress are going to be between these two plates that are acting against each other. And you can think kind of as this region, this gray region here, as being a single thin slice. A single thin slice on which we can 
ascribe or prescribe or put, I don't know exactly what the right word in English is actually, but on which we envision these average shear stresses induced by the force and the force on these two plates that are coming toward each other. And this shear stress is acting on this surface. Okay, what is this surface? This surface is say the top portion of this gray region here, all right? If it had some width, which we would think of like here, like the B, right? And it had some depth into the, into the board, right? Maybe we'd call that W. That would be the area. So we have a force acting parallel and over a given area. And we can think of this as having some average shear stress given by that force over area. So where do you see single shear? Well, as we kind of had on the first slide, you could think of it as having to do with a pin that is fixing two plates to each other, or maybe a rivet, or maybe a bolt, okay? And then these plates are being pulled apart and they are going to be causing there to be shear stress acting in between these plates on the bolt. Now, another common example of where you would find single shear is when you're trying to cut a material. So with a scissors, you have these two blades with a very narrow gap, and they apply a high shear stress to be able to break the material into at least two pieces. Shears, and these are these are old shears. I guess this reference comes from a picture taken in uh, the, the the Metropolitan Museum and in New York. So what you see here, even many, many years ago, thousands of years ago, people were able to use shears. They have a couple of plates of metal and they're able to get a high shear stress and they're able to cut things. And then you have manufacturing processes or fabrication processes. If you go to uh, many machine shops, you'll find maybe not this huge um, automated system, but uh, a shear uh, that is able to cut sheet metal with the push of a lever or a button as it applies a lot of force over a narrow gap and, and a small area to, to break the material in into at least two pieces. So those are the scenarios for single shear. Let's talk about double shear now. Double shear, as you might think, is kind of like twice as many surfaces as you would have in single shear. So here we have two sliding plates opposing the single plate, and we have two narrow gaps. So what does it look like? There are the narrow gaps. Here are the plates. Okay, these are the two plates opposing this single plate over here. And the shear stresses are spread on two thin slices. And it's kind of interesting to see that we have to be able to satisfy equilibrium. So the forces from these two plates, let's say on the right, it doesn't matter, but on this case, they're on the right. They end up being having the half the force. Sorry, that's not good English. Or, <laughs> sorry, I'm having trouble speaking. Okay, these end up being... Uh, exerting, or they end up exerting half the force of the force being exerted um, by this one plate on the left. So these two regions, okay, where again there's going to be a narrow gap and another narrow gap, these two regions are experiencing high shear. And if we pull one out, what we see is that there's some cross sectional area, cross sectional area A over which we have this shear stress acting, and we can consider it to be an average shear stress. And once again, we're thinking force divided by area. 
And which force are we thinking? Well, we have equilibrium saying that there's got to be F over 2 okay, acting down here. So that would F over 2 inducing this average shear stress here is going to mean that uh, over a given area A is going to mean that we have F over 2A as our average shear stress. So when do you see these scenarios? Well, we can have a situation where we have a pin, all right, and it's or a bolt and a pin or a bolt, right? And it's being used to clamp together different pieces of metal or different sheets. And what we see here is a configuration where the force in these two plates can be half what it was in the single shear case. And the shear stress, okay, for a given cross-sectional area and a given force that's anticipated for a design, this is going to be half of what we had in the single shear case as well. So instead of breaking things or cutting, all right, and that's not to say that's all single shear is good for. There are there are great situations. Um, uh, for, in fact, uh, this Purdue MET um, uh, creator on, on YouTube talks about how uh, skateboards are, or the skateboards, or the wheels on skateboards on the trucks, those are actually examples of single shear, and they're quite effective. But if we want to reduce the shear stress acting here or here or, you know, at a joint, we can employ the double shear design, such as in a bike fork or in a clevis with a pin going through it, to be able to reduce the amount of shear stress and thus use potentially less material and keep our design from failing. So the double shear is a, a common design technique that that engineers use or craftspeople or, or whatever you know that we use to be able to um, be able to reduce the amount of shear stress at a joint now let's take a look at what shear looks like in short beams and we're going to go through the two scenarios we're going to go through single shear and double shear so let's start with single shear. Here we have a bolt in between two plates, and the bolt is being sheared by these two plates. For the sake of simplicity, let us approximate this as being a cantilevered beam. You're like, what? Hold on. OK, so let's think this bottom plate has to be acting essentially to apply a force okay and this top plate also has to be acting to apply a force and at least one of them needs to also be able to apply a restraining moment or a reaction moment so that the bolt doesn't just fly out right you, you've probably seen this happen if you have a scissors where the blades are a little bit far apart, in fact, right? That it can kind of twist and you lose your paper, you don't cut, it just bends instead of shears, okay? Foreshadowing here. So this is a simple scenario. Now, maybe you think, ah, oh, really, I should have, like, fixed, fixed. Well, to keep this a determinant, simple system, we're going to do fixed free with a load on the end, okay? And we can perform external equilibrium. We are familiar with this, this scenario. And you can uh, go back and look at the notes when we've covered this, but we'll just go right to the plotting of the shear force and bending moment diagrams. Uh, you might see that, okay, you know, if I go a little bit over here, I have to balance out this FL with a sh uh, shear force going down and that FL is equal to P, so, and then there's nothing acting across here, there's no distributed load, so it's just going to be a constant across the length, and that's what we see. And what's its value? P, 
is its value. Okay. Now, there are multiple ways to think about how to handle the bending moment, but if we're using kind of the integral form, we see, oh, there is this shear force, P. We integrate that. That means that P is now going to be the slope, right, for a moment. And we would, you know, look at what the boundary conditions say, where are we starting? And if we had an internal moment, it's got to be minus ML. And ML is equal to PL. So where does it start? It starts off at minus PL and it goes to zero. Where's the maximum moment? Well, the maximum bending moment is here at minus PL or at zero where it's PL. What do we see? We see here a, a, a couple of things, but one is that the bending moment scales with L, all right? So it means that the internal shear force will dominate bending moment for small length. So what are we saying there? We're saying that, look, if I make L smaller and smaller and smaller, like I bring it closer and closer to this axis, right? P is not changing, okay? but the maximum bending moment that I have is also going to go down. So if I make it shorter or if I make the beam smaller and smaller and smaller, essentially this bending moment is eventually going to go to zero, right? And all you're going to see is P. When does this gap? I said it. Well, when does it get very small? When does L get very small? Well, essentially when these two plates are right next to each other, all right? Imagine that this is essentially a sideways version of this, or this is a sideways version of this cantilevered beam. So we have an idea of how the bending moment will scale with the gap, and it goes down quite a bit, and then shear, internal shear force, dominates. And if we're attempting to break, material or shear a material or we're just trying to whoops I went too fast or we're just trying to keep the material from yielding we need to design appropriately to have enough area or so if we're trying to keep it from breaking enough area right to support the given uh, shear force okay and that and, and we're going to be calculating out some in this case, some average shear stress. Well, let's go over to the next case, which as you can see, it already popped up, is double shear. So what does double shear look like in terms of a beam? Well, you could argue this is not the best abstraction, okay? And we're talking about very short beams. But let's say that it's similar to saying that we have this force P acting on this center plate, and we have these two plates over here going the opposite direction, right? So you see that essentially this material and this material in between those plates would be this material and this material on this beam. So we do external equilibrium here. We see, okay, we have P over two and P over two, right? And that makes sense like we'd have P over two, P over two, and P, right, for those arrows. And if we draw the shear force diagram, okay, what do we get? Well, we get that we're going to have a shear force of P over two over here on the left side. And then we come over here and we have a jump, right? Delta V is going to be equal to P. Right, the change in the shear force is going to be equal to p, so that means that we jump down to minus p over two, and we end there, right? And we can double check that that's the case uh, as we if we look at the boundary conditions that we would have here, right? So shear force coming down against p over two, check. Shear force if we covered the left side and we looked at the shear force, right? It'd be in the same direction as p over two means that it has to be minus p over 2. Well, what about the, the bending moment across this beam? Well, we can think of it a couple different ways. Again, 
One is to say, these are pins or pin and ruler. And so at the ends, there's no bending moment. So we know that at the ends, at, at x equals zero and x equals uh, L, bending moment has to be equal to zero. That's fine. And then we can say, oh, well, um, we know what the slope is, at least, right? We know that it's going to slope at p over 2 because we integrate the shear force. And we're going to max out in the middle. And then it's going to flip. And we're going to go back down with a slope of minus p over 2. Okay, And so this is what the bending moment diagram looks like. The average shear stress in this scenario is going to be this p over 2 okay, acting over 2a. So p over 2 divided by 2a is going to give us p over 4a. So in this scenario, with a given uh, force p, all right, we see that the average shear stress is going to be less than what you have with the single shear scenario. We can also see that as we decrease the gap, all right, so if we make this beam shorter and shorter, right, which means that the gap, which would be somewhere over here and over here, right, between these plates, okay, this is if this is kind of rotated sideways, right, and we're now looking at okay, what is what is the the length of this of these um of 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 these gaps, okay. What we see there is that, once again, the bending moment is going to go down and then the shear force is going to be what, the internal shear force is what's going to be dominating. So internal shear force is half of what is present in single shear. Max bending moment is a quarter of what is present in single shear and it also scales with length. Okay, so what we've attempted to do here is come up with a couple of simple bending models, well, they're not really bending models, but they're beam-based models. And then when we shorten these beams and we make it so that there's essentially a very small gap between the different supports, we get a scenario where we're able to see that bending moment becomes insignificant and the load that we're worried about uh, supporting is, uh, is, is from the shear force. Well, we have a couple questions now to, to further expand our knowledge based on what we've had in this session. We're going to look at a rectangular profile okay, with a base B and a height H under single shear. And the question is, at what length L would the average shear stress be half the maximum bending stress? Okay, So we're going to be looking at the flexor formula. We're going to be looking at tau average and looking at when what condition needs to be met such that that half okay the bending stress is going to give us the shear stress okay and similarly we're going to do the same thing but look at what condition needs to be met for l such that the average stress is half the maximum bending stress. This concludes part one of session 14 on beams in which we've covered single shear and double shear and how to use double shear in design and how to also get an idea of what the average shear stress would be in both scenarios for single shear and double shear. Thank you.